What are some of the craziest robberies criminals will try to do? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, masks off. Brothers Benjamin Murphy and George Murphy Bristow dressed up as old men to commit armed robbery. The brothers arrived at a local jewelry store wearing extremely lifelike latex face masks, making them look like they're balding older men. They demanded that the staff let them in, and for some reason, the request was granted. Once they were inside, an employee brought them to the back office, where the disguised men tied him to a chair with cable ties and removed his Rolex watch worth $18,200. $26 from his wrist. The two menaced everyone with a knife and a hatchet, then searched the staff area for more valuable items before the alarm was finally raised. So they fled the scene in a getaway vehicle parked outside. A few weeks later, the police pulled over a suspicious vehicle 36 miles from where the robbery occurred. They identified the driver as George and found two full face masks and clothing identical to that worn by the robbery suspects. George was apparently not very good about keeping his car clean. Officers probably found some ancient french fries under his seat as well. Anyway, officers also uncovered a black bag containing the hatchet, knife, and cable ties used during the incident. Investigators performed a forensic examination into the saliva found inside the two masks and linked the DNA to George and Benjamin. Authorities arrested both men and charged them with robbery and possession of a bladed article. The brothers pleaded not guilty in court, but the jury only needed an hour to declare that the two men were guilty. Guilty. George received 18 years behind bars, and Benjamin received a 13-year sentence. Number 5. A Florida Robbery Story A gang used a jackhammer to knock out the alarms of a jewelry store so they could steal over $500,000 worth of jewelry. The robbery occurred at Boo Daddy Diamonds in Hollywood, Florida, and took under 5 minutes. The thieves broke into the store through the roof and dropped down into the showroom. They used a jackhammer to disable the alarm system and cut through its wires. However, they didn't realize that a ring camera captured the entire incident, as well as their faces and other identifiable information about the robbers. In the video, the thieves walked around the store and picked up anything they thought was valuable. They grabbed a rare Chanel bag and a bottle of Louis XIII cognac, valued at $3,500. One of the men was walking around with a flashlight in his mouth when he noticed the camera, prompting him to flash the light at one of his accomplices. The suspects then fled the scene with half a million dollars worth of goods. As of the release of this video, authorities have yet to catch the robbers, but they have fingerprints, DNA, and pictures from the scene. The owner is hopeful that they'll be brought to justice soon. It sounds like it's just a matter of time. It's kind of funny though, because these guys obviously had a plan. The owner said they had this big jamming device with a bunch of antennas that they used to mess with the security system before they cut the wires. It sounds like this cool specialized piece of equipment that the tech guy made for them, since every heist gang has a tech guy, right? But they were still caught by a silly ring camera you buy off of Amazon. It sounds like they need a new tech guy. Number four, Mountain High Heist. Thieves carried out a daring high-altitude heist when they scaled a Swiss mountain to steal cash from a donation box at the top. The group traversed gorges and climbed 7,710 feet to reach the box, which belonged to a local climbing club that maintained the route. The climbing route is one of the most challenging in the country. It has scaling ladders secured to vertical rock face and then steel cables for traversing gorges. The climbing club relied on donations to maintain the trail, so the donation box was crucial. Members of the group of thieves used brute force to access the box, using tools to smash it and drain it of all cash. Many believe that the heist was planned some time in advance, as the hike was too intense for the criminals to do on a whim. Due to the route's popularity, it was almost impossible to track down the culprits. It was also difficult to know how much money was stolen, although club members estimated it was likely around $550. Hikers often donate to maintaining hiking paths and climbing routes in Switzerland, and avid climbers urge people to not be afraid of donating due to the incident. And sure, 550 bucks is a lot of money, but not that much money. Why go to all the trouble and risk your life for such a small amount? They also must be experienced since they were aware of the box and how to get to it, so they would know that the donation benefits everyone. Some people. Number three, gone in 19 seconds. 
A Texas thief stole $200,000 worth of property from a public parking lot in under 20 seconds. Adam Lewis and his family enjoyed a relaxing day at the beach, but when they finished, Lewis was unable to park his Ford F-250 Limited with an 18-foot flatbed trailer, which was carrying his 2021 Polaris North Star Edition in the parking garage of his apartment building. Lewis reserved two spots in a pay-to-park public parking lot in Dallas, with plans to take the buggy to the shop for maintenance the following day. However, when he returned to the parking lot the next morning, the truck and buggy were gone. The lot's manager confirmed that a security guard from the overnight shift said that a tow truck came into the lot during the night. Security camera footage showed the thief back up to Lewis's trailer and Polaris and put them on his tow truck, a move that only took 19 seconds. Lewis got even more surveillance footage from a nearby Bank of America, which had a better view of the tow truck's plates. Unfortunately, when Lewis filed an insurance claim and reported the theft to the Dallas Police Department, authorities discovered that the truck's Texas Department of Licensing and Registrations number were fake. The police recovered the wreckage of Lewis's truck a few days later, which was completely stripped with the bed, seats, steering wheel, and engine removed. The thieves also took Lewis's three-year-old daughter's car seat, puzzles, and toys. The stolen property was valued at roughly $200,000. And while Lewis asked anyone with information on the robbery to report it to law enforcement, he knew he would likely never fully recover everything that the thieves took. It was pretty clever for this guy to use a tow truck, since it seems like tow truck guys have this weird kind of authority. Like, if you see a tow truck guy picking up someone's car, you'd never question it. you just assume that this guy is allowed to just take the car and leave and you move on with your day. Number two, a briefcase full of cash. And this story begins with three, er, we'll call them ladies of the night, and two masked men. They stole $96,000 in lawsuit settlement money from Saul Mata Villages. Villages was celebrating his $96,000 lawsuit settlement at the Van Cortland Motel in the Bronx and decided to call these ladies to join in the celebration. Three women arrived at his hotel room, and after a few hours of alone time together, probably just talking, one of them suggested that their friend come by to drop off some things that help, uh, let's just say, keep the night going. But instead of showing up with fun, two masked men showed up at the motel in the early hours of the morning with firearms. They burst into the room and grabbed Villages' suitcase full of money. Law enforcement has since released photos of the thieves, including images of the men climbing out of a black minivan when they first arrived at the motel. Villages was obviously devastated. He said he desperately needed the money to help move his family and fund his nighttime activities, but panicked during the confrontation, making it easy for the criminals to take the money and run. He said he suffered from extreme anxiety after the event and replayed it over and over in his mind, which is understandable. Law enforcement have been unable to locate the three women and two men or recover Villages' money. The lesson here is maybe don't invite a bunch of morally compromised strangers to hang out with you when you have 100k laying around in a briefcase. Seriously, he kept almost $100,000 in a briefcase? How clean shake can you get? If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how they almost pulled off the biggest diamond heist in history. Number one, the inside job. Jobson Marangoni de Castro stole almost $2 million in designer goods and jewelry from two guests at the Peninsula Beverly Hills Hotel. De Castro made multiple trips back and forth via Uber to the hotel on the night of the crime. On one of the trips, he spoke to a hotel desk employee and answered security questions to get a key to the victim's hotel room. The victims were two Brazilians who were in Beverly Hills for a fashion event. De Castro got into their room but quickly left when he found one of the victims sleeping. He returned later in the night to remove the suitcases filled with expensive diamond jewelry and other luxury items from the room. A week later, De Castro searched for a buyer on Instagram and traveled to Miami where he sold the jewelry, which he claimed belonged to his late mother, for $50,000, despite it being worth over a million. Clearly, De Castro didn't know what he had or how much it was worth. Investigators got a search warrant for data about De Castro's Uber trips, which they matched to GPS data, De Castro's profile picture, and hotel surveillance footage. There were also two air tags inside one of the suitcases, which law enforcement found across the street from DeCastro's Rodeo Drive apartment building. DeCastro actually went to the Peninsula Beverly Hills Hotel the night before the theft and charged a meal at the hotel bar to the victim's room, which is both kind of funny, but also stupid. Most likely, the victims caught DeCastro's attention when he saw them wearing elaborate jewelry and expensive clothing. After all, how many couples travel with six suitcases for one trip? This guy was always going to get caught, too. He memorably talked to hotel employees 
worries about getting the key, had dinner there the night before, and was easily traced through his Uber account, didn't know how much the items were worth or whom to sell them to. Maybe next time, leave the crimes to the people who know what they're doing, Jobson. In November of 2000, a gang under investigation for a few botched armored truck robberies threw caution to the wind and went for a giant payday. The Millennium Experience, held at the Millennium Dome in Greenwich, Southeast London, was the target. The Millennium Experience shows off some of the most precious stones in the world. The vast array of wealth on display attracted the would-be robbers to the dome, but their ineptitude would, once again, be their demise. Lee Wenham led the gang of nine criminals. He owned Tong Farm, the gang's base of operations. Investigators believe that all of their criminal enterprises branched from the farm. The police tracked stolen vehicles there long before the robberies took place, but decided to wait for a more significant charge to land. The Diamond Heist wasn't their first attempted robbery. They tried to rob multiple armored trucks before settling their sights on the Millennium Dome. On July 7 of 2000, an armored truck left the depot carrying over 8 million pounds. The depot was 20 miles from Tong Farm, close enough to suspect Wenham and his gang. The robbery was surprisingly well planned, but it still didn't pan out for the crew of career criminals. They started the robbery by blocking off the truck's path with another vehicle. When they couldn't cut through to the cash in the back, they had another truck outfitted with a huge spike crash into it. The guards were helpless at this point, as the gang told them the vehicle had explosives attached to it and would blow if the guards even blinked. On top of this, they also cut the hydraulic cables, immobilizing the armored truck. After a couple of rams, they had punctured the armor enough to claim their prize. But just as they were about to taste success, the police showed up. Realizing it was over, they executed their escape by boarding a speedboat and speeding off down the Medway River. After all that planning and damage, the only thing they escaped with was their freedom. The attention that Wenham and his crew gained is what ultimately wrecked their plans. The police had constant surveillance and followed Wenham to the Millennium Dome when it opened to the public in 2000. The dome was home to the Millennium Experience, an exhibition to celebrate the start of the new millennium. It featured several exhibits and shows to entertain all of its patrons. There was art on display everywhere and plays held in the performance area at the center of the dome. Their own unique show with 165 acrobats and music by Peter Gabriel was performed almost a thousand times that year. After some financial troubles caused by low attendance put it in jeopardy, the dome had to rebrand. It was renamed the O2 Arena in 2005 and after some redevelopment was reopened opened in 2007 with a Bon Jovi concert. In 2017, they outperformed Madison Square Garden, gaining the title of the busiest arena in the world. So what did Wenham's gang have their sights set on? De Beers' diamond collection was kept in an exhibit inside of the dome. The exhibition featured some of the most expensive gems in the world. One of these precious gems was the Millennium Star. And no, it's not a silly mashup of the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star from Star Wars. It's the world's second largest grade D diamond. The Millennium Star is a flawless hair-shaped diamond and its grade comes from its complete lack of color. Here's a quick lesson in diamond color grading for you. D is the highest grade a diamond can be. That means it's completely colorless. Most diamonds contain a faint yellow tint. The more prevalent the tint, the lower the grade. The Millennium Star is insured for an astonishing $100 million, making it a prime target for the would-be jewel thieves. But the star wasn't the only precious stone in the building. The exhibit also included 11 blue diamonds, one of which was the Heart of Eternity. The heart exists in a class of rare colored diamonds. The De Beers Group purchased these gems over the years to add to their collection. De Beers is an international corporation that specializes in all things diamond. They have their hands in everything from the mining process to the retail part of the industry. Founded in 1888, the De Beers Group controlled over 80% of the diamond business and kept the monopoly going until the 21st century. The monopoly has since crumbled to competition, and De Beers now controls about 30% of the world's diamond market today. The police hadn't taken their eye off of Wenham and his crew since their previous attempted robberies. This attention followed them to the Millennium Dome after police got a tip of the upcoming robbery. London's Metropolitan Police had one of the most profitable robberies in history under their surveillance, entrusting the case to the Flying Squad, a specialist unit also known as the Robbery Squad. The Flying Squad is a branch of the serious and organized crime 
Time Command and focuses solely on robberies. With their eagle-eyed precision, the robbery was doomed to fail before it ever began. There were a lot of unknown variables at the start of their investigation. They didn't know a lot about the thieves' plan, but they were sure about one thing, what the target was. The Flying Squad knew that the Wenham gang would go after the priceless jewels. To make sure they didn't get nabbed due to something unforeseen trick, the Flying Squad kept an ace up their sleeves, but we'll reveal that later. Under constant surveillance, it was easy for the police to piece the Wenham gang's plan together. They were seen in the water across from the dome practicing with a speedboat, proving that they would make their getaway on the Thames River. The Flying Squad determined what days the robbery might be attempted. With this knowledge, they were able to alert the dome's management and set up preventative operations. The attempts began at the start of October. They aborted their first attempt after their getaway speedboat malfunctioned. The second attempt came right after the first, but was called off because the tide was too low. After analyzing all of their activities on top of their failed attempts, the investigators realized the crew would make their escape at high tide. With this knowledge in hand, they determined when the robbery would be attempted again by watching for high tide. The gang's plan was like the opening scene of a superhero movie. A semi-coordinated gang of would-be thieves crashes through the walls and goes in loud. On November 7 at 9.30 a.m., a quiet morning was disrupted by a modified JCB earth digger, which is like a backhoe, crashing through the wall of the Millennium Dome. Four gang members, decked out in body armor and gas masks, rode the battering ram through the wall. These members were Aldo Cariocci, Raymond Betson, William Cochran, and Robert Adams. They drove the JCB right up to the money zone and went straight in. Once they made it inside, the gang all played their parts. Chiarochi started throwing out smoke bombs while Cockrum went straight for the reinforced glass protecting the gems. The glass was very strong and capable of withstanding a 60-ton ram, but the gang had planned for this. Cockrum had a very high-powered nail gun that was popular in jewelry robberies at the time. He used it to punch three holes in the glass, weakening it so that Adams could smash it in with his sledgehammer. It must have seemed like everything was going smoothly to the Wenham gang, right up until they were swarmed by police in order to put their hands up. Had they snatched the jewels, they planned to escape in the waiting speedboat, riding the Thames River all the way to a multi-million dollar payday. Remember that ace up their sleeve? Well, before the gang got anywhere near the Millennium Dome, the Flying Squad replaced all the diamonds with replicas. If the robbers escaped, they'd be holding bags full of fake diamonds. So we wonder, why not let them take the fake diamonds and arrest them once they were all in the speedboat? The plan to stop the robbery was called Operation Magician. The police were beyond prepared for these criminals and quickly stopped their plan with no casualties. They had replaced all the dome employees with armed officers and waited for the gang to make their move. Once the chaos started, the officer's first priority was to deal with the grenade tosser and the driver of the JCB. He surrounded the machine and ordered Raymond Betson to get down. Betson stepped down from the JCB. He said that he didn't have anything to do with the robbery and worked at the dome. However, the police saw right through the man's blatant lie and arrested him. With two members in custody, the officers needed to apprehend the other two trying to break the glass. They did so by tossing stun grenades in the room and swarming the two criminals in full tactical gear. With that smooth arrest, Operation Magician was a success. Millman, the speedboat driver, was scooped up on the dock by an ambush team before he even knew it was happening. Of course, with all the evidence piling up, the police went and picked up Wenham later that day. Like sharks to bloody water, the media swarmed the trial to soak up every piece of the story. During the trial, Cockrum said, I couldn't believe how simple it was. It was a gift. I couldn't believe security was so bad. According to Cockrum, the body armor the crew was wearing was to protect them after the fact when they went to sell the jewel. The jury came back with a guilty verdict after a short deliberation. The judge spoke to the crew saying, you played for very high stakes and you must have known perfectly well what the penalty would be if your enterprise did not succeed. Betsam and Cochran got 18 years, while Kiriochi and Adams got 15. Wenham was sentenced to 13 years collectively for his crimes and Millman died of cancer before the trial. With the sentencing out of the way, there was one step left to wrap this story up with a nice little bow. The Flying Squad's last target was a man named James Hurley, who just so happened to disappear right before the raid. The Flying Squad believed he was the real mastermind behind the entire plot, not Wenham. The police had evidence of him taking pictures of the dome from a boat on the Thames and dubbed him the Boatman. He was eventually located at Puerto Banus in Costa del Sol and arrested by Spanish police after a speedboat chase. Things weren't looking good for him until the Crown Prosecution Service withdrew the extradition order. The prosecution didn't believe there was anything to be gained by taking Hurley to trial after a similar case was thrown out. Old habits die hard, as they say, and this rang true for Raymond Betson. In 2012, he was arrested after fumbling his way through another robbery. Betson used a digger to rob a Loomis Cash Depot by smashing the machine through the wall, reminiscent of his previous 
this work. However, he and his crew smashed through the wrong wall and found themselves in an empty warehouse. Then, after searching it and finding nothing, the criminals had to flee. Their getaway vehicle was found in a field with a balaclava and hairnet nearby in the bushes. Police used these articles of clothing to convict Betson with DNA evidence. In 2014, he was sentenced to another 13 years in prison. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather do, give up beef or give up chicken.